Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Becca Zombeck, and here I'll be sharing with you our new 3 billion year compilation of paleosols, their geochemistry, and preservation biases, as well as discussing briefly some implications for marine biogeochemistry and tectonics. So much of what we think we know about Earth's history has come from these high-resolution shale records, including events like the rise of oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, major carbon cycle perturbations, and innovations uh, on the continents. And while these are important records that have informed many biogeochemical models, they offer a bit of an incomplete picture, and the models that rely on them often make assumptions about the continental side of the equation. And continental weathering can be considered a starting point, really, for many biogeochemical cycles, both on land and in the oceans, yet it remains relatively poorly constrained, um, or is just estimated throughout Earth's history. And that's what we seek to rectify here. So we have a couple of indirect measures of weathering and ways of finding out the geochemical composition of weathered material in the upper continental crust. Um, this is in shales and glacial diamictites in the marine realm and fluvial sandstones on land and in coastal areas. But we also have a direct record of continental weathering in paleosols. And so by providing quantitative constraints on continental weathering and the weathering products, the paleosol record can be combined with these other weathering records to make sure we have the most complete picture of weathering and biogeochemical cycles, accounting for each step in the weathering process from source to sink. Um, and it's been argued that the upper continental crust has in fact evolved through time, switching between more mafic and felsic periods, uh, which would of course affect the composition of the weathering product. And this is something that we can actually test with this new record. And another p potential control on weathering could actually be just the amount of exposed continental land area um, for which different timelines have been proposed. And so these are two big sort of crustal and tectonic pictures that we can directly address with this new record. Before we can use and interpret the paleosol geochemical record, we have to understand what the data are representing, what time periods and places are being shown. So we should really consider potential preservation biases in this record. And so what we might expect to see is a peak in paleosol preservation around the same time as, as a zircon peak, which is thought generally to represent crustal production. And so here in the dark gray bars, I have just uh, plotted the zircon distributions through time along with some of the supercontinents in the vertical gray bars. And if we overlay our paleosol record, we see that there is in fact pretty good correlation between the paleosol peaks and the zircon peaks. And we see a couple of things in addition to that. We see a general increase in preservation, or at least samples, through time. We also see that there are a couple of periods where we have high paleosol sample numbers, but low uh, zircon. And so we interpret this as actually being oversampling periods of interest. Um, for example, here, around 2.2 billion years uh, at the Great Oxygenation event, we have an oversampling uh, event. And the gaps in this record could be from a period of high erosion or simply a lack of accumulation or deposition, for example, um, during an intense glacial period or a period of low continental area. Which brings us to an important point that the changes in land area can affect um, how many paleosols are preserved. And changes in the amount of subaerially exposed continents could also affect the volume and flux of nutrients and elements from the continents to the ocean, which I'll discuss in a bit. Shales display some of the same preservation patterns and biases, with shale peaks coinciding with zircon peaks and a general increase in preservation or sampling through time. We see some holes in the shale record where paleosols don't have a gap, and importantly, there are some holes that are shared between the two records, for example, at the onset of Rodinia, and we can really use this information to pinpoint key periods in the geologic record where we would really benefit from having more samples, so that can help target future efforts. Another factor that we can look at when we're thinking about preservation bias and what the paleosol record represents is actually the thickness of these paleosol or weathering profiles through time. And here I show a box plot of modern soil profile thicknesses, um, averaging about one meter thick. And so with this in mind, we can look at the paleosol record, and we see that paleosol and weathering profile thicknesses generally decrease slightly through time. And this decrease through time could be due to a couple of different things. We could simply have a preservation bias towards preserving these very thick, older profiles because there's just more material. It's harder to erode away the entire profile. 
And it can also be due to a combination of changing surface exposure time and changes in weathering intensity, which is essentially related to climate. And so now looking at the geochemistry of this paleosol record, uh, we've compiled a number of different uh, geochemical weathering proxies. And we see that weathering in these different proxies is pretty consistent through time, at least for the periods are that are preserved. And biogeochemical models often rely on using the weathering knob uh, to control the fluxes of nutrients and elements from the continents to the ocean. So when we see here that there isn't actually too much change in continental weathering, and so if we can't rely on changes in the degree of weathering through time, we can instead look to a change in the exposed continental area as a control on how much material can be weathered and how much can be delivered from the continents to the oceans. In addition to looking at the geochemical weathering indices, we also looked at a couple of individual elements in these paleosols. So here we have iron-3 on top and phosphorus on the bottom, both of which have been invoked as major drivers for changes in marine biogeochemical cycles. And here we see that they're both pretty stable through time, which again suggests that changes in the degree of weathering rather than compositional changes in the crust could likely control these fluxes. And additionally, this points to the importance of biological innovations in marine nutrient use efficiency and productivity for controlling, um, the, for example, the rise of oxygen. And finally, we looked at a few other elements that are relevant to um, weathering and marine biogeochemical cycles. And we see generally uh, not much change through time, but we do see a potential increase in calcium in paleosols through time which is relevant for paleoclimate proxies that use calcium, as well as uh, those that rely on carbonate geochemistry. And so to sum up our takeaways, uh, the paleosol record does have some preservation biases that are linked to zircon distributions and therefore the supercontinent cycle, but we're not sure exactly which part of the supercontinent cycle provides the greatest preservation. And we also see this decrease in paleosol profile thickness through time, which could be related to soil forming factors such as surface age or climate, or it could also be a preservation bias just towards preserving those thicker profiles. We see a very consistent degree of weathering as well as paleosol composition through time, which really points to the importance of changes in land area and biological innovations when we're thinking about the major biogeochemical changes that happen through Earth's history, as well as the evolution of the atmosphere. And with that, I would just like to thank the undergrad researchers who helped make this database possible and welcome any questions. I look forward to talking with you all.